Good day, Kathleen. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me. And of course, Guy, anytime. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and work and what you do? Uh, sure. I'm Kathleen Whiteside Langdon. I live now in Bellingham, Washington, and I consider myself a semi-retired co-president of Performance International. And I say semi-retired because although we don't tend to do marketing, there are occasions on which uh, we do indeed do some work. So we fit that into a very full semi-retired life mm -hmm. here and abroad. Thank you. Can you share with us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and where you went to school, college, and what you studied? Sure. I um, am an Army brat, and so that uh, means that I started out in lots of places. I was born in California, lived in Pennsylvania briefly. I lived in Arizona, Texas, Panama, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, Germany is where I graduated from high school. So I went to 10 schools before I graduated from high school and then uh, chose a college in the middle of the country because I had no idea where my parents would be. <laughs> and it turned out to be in Atchison, Kansas of all places. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a small, at that time, uh, women's college, which is now uh, co-ed, and it's now called the Benedictine Colleges. I was an English major. I was planning to be a high school teacher. And um, then, in terms of education, uh, move about 10 years, and I did a master's at Wayne State University, uh, one in English with almost a doctorate, and then also most of a master's in teaching. All of that was intended to do either public school or junior college teaching, and my timing was really awful. Uh, at the time, there were 750 applicants through the Modern Language Association pool for English teachers in the U.S. So um, I had also done instructional design. That was my uh, first job out of college, actually, at uh, Prudential Life Insurance in Newark, New Jersey, and also uh, in the training department at AT&T, and, and another year and a half or so with Mind, Inc., which um, is where I met Glenn Valentine, whom some people know. So uh, my cluster was all around instructional design, uh, teaching and training. And the, one of the things that happened to me is that, and I connect it to all of these different schools that I went to, is that uh, I have an unusual brain. I understand that. Um, I'm really bright and quick in many ways. And then there are these holes in my um, learning process. And one of the things that I got out of the Prudential Life Insurance experience where I was hired to develop a, an instructional design program um, <clears throat> was the question of sequencing. And I had never understood how to take what was in my textbook and translate it into a logical sequence. Um, and I'm very driven by logic and can absorb a lot if it's logical. The lack of sequence in many textbooks really kind of drove, drove me crazy. And um, that was one of the big things that came out of instructional design for me. I also, at that time, was um, in the mind incorporated. We were teaching um, the hardcore unemployed. And that was really teaching um, eighth grade math and English to uh, young people as well as long-term employees who had taken the Wonderlich test, which is essentially an IQ test. And because of the 
all of the problems with educational systems at that time, they were often relegated to janitorial or other entry-level jobs. And our work with the National Alliance of Businessmen was to um, give them the skills and the tools to be able to progress and fill more complicated positions. It was uh, work that I really loved and um, hated to leave it, but I did, and I moved to Detroit. It was a boy, and um, <laughs> when I got to Detroit, there was no one who that I talked to that understood the kind of work I had done. Um, I reported to vice presidents because of the fact that this is staff work, and they were all thinking I was blowing smoke or something. Um, so I ended up doing a series of piddly jobs, um, got my master's, had my kids, and um, then one day uh, there was an ad in the paper, in the Detroit paper, um, for an instructional designer job. And it was at uh, Hudson's, the department store, and Erica Keeps was the managing um manager who hired the hiring manager and we had a wonderful interview and she said you know we have this thing it's called msit and you really need to go whether i hire you or not and um that anecdote about being basically unemployed or way underemployed for a six-year period of time because i didn't know how to get to the people who understood instructional design and the skills that I brought. So MSIT then always had a place in my heart. I devoted a lot of energy, um, met a variety of people, including you there. And um, it just was something that was really important um, for me and for my development. It was through MSIT and later ISPI that I met a variety of people, including my husband. Um, so um, it's um, not always a heartfelt thing for people, uh, but for me, it always was. It was a, a heart relationship rather than, and then professional as well, but certainly mm -hmm. um, personal. Um, then I worked for Erica at the Hudson's department store for a couple of years. And by that time, I knew Frank Wydra, and he was then vice president at, at um, the hospital, two hospitals in um, Detroit. And while it was a, a very ragged and rough interview process, Frank wasn't sure that I could ever finish anything. Uh, he was a very insightful man. It takes a lot of energy on my part to finish things. Um, but what he was doing was um, he was the youngest personnel uh, vice president at Allied Supermarkets first, where he understood the power that the training department had for shaping the whole organization. And so that was very exciting. And um, there was also an appeal to be in a hospital. And um, so I was excited to become the first training manager in a hospital in Michigan. Um, and what the other thing that Frank had figured out early on um, when he was at Allied Supermarkets, he didn't have a training budget to train his own staff. And he figured out that if he had a professional society that he could direct people to, and he was directive, <laughs> um, then they would have a chance to do things that were in a um, fail-free no fail environment. Um, so they had to put out newsletters, they had to make presentations, they had to organize events, they had to uh, train, um, you know, factor in the finances, all of those kinds of skills 
which were transferable then in the workplace. He got to see as they employed them or not in this um, professional society. So I took every, every, every advantage of that thinking. Um, so when I came over to the, um, to the hospital, they were prepared to pay my um, membership fee in ISPI, but they also had a rule. And the rule was that you got to go to the conference if you met two criteria. One was that you had been active in the local society, in MSIT, and also that you had submitted to do a presentation. In addition, he also generally expected people, <clears throat> although it wasn't contingent on going, uh, to publish an article at least once a year. And he was willing and able to um, coach you through it and help, but the that set of expectations that you would pro develop professionally was very, very deep. And because of my background, um, I was like a little sponge for it all. <clears throat> I, excuse me. <clears throat> I have a funny paradoxical thing about myself, which is that I tend to do hard things easily and well and have a lot of trouble with easy things. And what I mean by that is that I get acclimated to organizations very quickly. I build relationships very quickly. I understand what's going on quite quickly. But ask me to set up a filing system or to find a piece of paper that somebody gave me four days ago. Um, those are, are real challenges and they continue to be challenges. So. Um, for me to be able to fill in so many blanks in that development process by working through um, both MSIT, where I was president, I guess I'm a long a what, uh, life member now, and then also to move into ISPI. And at ISPI, um, I was, I'll probably come back to it, but I was very careful to go through all of the various positions. So I did chapters work. I did the awards work. I did communications work. Um, I had been also, and I'd almost forgotten this, I was a, a second to a number of presidents. Um, uh, Seth Liebler, uh, Dick Lincoln, and Diane Dormant. Um, where I helped with stage managing and I did coaching and I did long-term, you know, th thought processes and so on and ended up also being the um, a vice president in the early 80s when Detroit hosted the international conference and that was a real watershed. Um, I hired Erica Keats, who had been my boss earlier, to be the conference manager. And we did introduce um, a level of classiness that had sort of been missing before that. Bob Powers did it, laid the groundwork, and then we built on it and made the conference um, a much more sophisticated kind of event um, together. And then Ten years after that or so, I ran for president and had the toughest year ever. I'll take that award in a minute. Okay. So um, then uh, I was at the hospital for about ten years and did HR uh, as well as training, but a lot of OD work there. And um, I managed a major reorganization. Uh, I did strategic planning, uh, installed a learner controlled instruction, supervisory program, and so on. And um, in the late 80s, uh, moved to California. And uh, at that point, I decided that I wanted to be doing freelance work. 
Um, my kids were teenagers. They had always lived in Detroit. And I didn't see that a corporate job was, uh, with all the hours and the commute, was in keeping. So um, it turned out that Sam Schmickler had a firm in uh, Santa Monica. And there was a call for veteran training people. And I met that qualification. There were a lot of, uh, there was a project with Apple. And there were a number of um, fresh out of school students, either masters or PhDs, in training and development instructional design. And um, one of the things about young people is that their enthusiasm is wonderful and their excitement and so on. But uh, there are uh, rough edges usually. And those rough edges were something that needed a little bit of help with someone that, or people who had been around the block more than once. And I qualified for that. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, I was able to work with, on a freelance basis with clients um, like Apple and Nissan, um, and then spent a several years as an external to Southern California Edison. I ran the training department. I did uh, more OD work there and um, uh, did a lot of staff development with the um, training department, which had been made up of people who had been very good in their jobs um, and or not very good in their jobs, in both cases sent to the training department. And um, the training manager had her hands full without also needing to do that kind of development work with her staff. So we built um, a number of tools for her staff and I managed it for a while, a collection of things. And that was about the time I became president of ISPI as well. So that brings me to oh, almost today, um, which is where Danny and I have been doing Performance International uh, since the mid-90s. And um, there are, uh, it's probably better to answer the question about positioning myself in HPT um, because that's, I think, where the variety of experiences come together is in the work we have been doing, um, teach, teaching and consulting in, with the language of work and developing it and doing proof of concept. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, let me take you back a little bit. Uh, thank you for okay. all that ramp up to where <laughs> you are today. But, and some of it you hit on, but your first exposures to human performance technology or however you refer to it, because people refer to it differently. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about that first exposure. Was it Erica? Was it Frank? Was, who, who helped mm. you discover this? Um, it was definitely Erica first. Uh, one of the things that she did was to have a weekly book club discussion. So she wanted to be sure, first of all, that we understood the basic principles of um, behavioral psychology. And one of the things was the pre-MAC principle was a big one for me, where you reward um, at the end, um, letting people see, or let rewarding people after they've done a particular task, especially in my case, an odious or onerous task. Um, that was a big insight. So sequencing was one I mentioned, and I think the pre-MAC principle was a second. Certainly contingency management and having kids and um, all of that, and building, seeing inside organizations the importance of rewarding the behavior that you want and um, not having the behavior that you don't want rewarded. Um, so I did a lot in those two areas, um, sharing it with managers often mm -hmm. so that they would see when they came to me with a complaint um, and they wanted a training solution 
we would do the analysis and show that actually doing it wrong was much more rewarding to the folks and that no matter how much we trained them that problem would not go away and um, that's to me that is the way that led into what's generally called OD or, or organization development work mm -hmm. some of my favorite interventions I think uh, really fall in the OD world and it's um, probably truly more compatible with my personality and my interests. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one important influence. The second was obviously Wydra um, and one of the things about him in particular was that he had an incredible ability to figure out what it was that made people feel rewarded. And so for me, he could get me to do almost anything. <laughs> and there were some very big jobs he gave me. Um, but what he, he, what the reward was, and we're going back a long time before telephones and so on, was that I had basically an unlimited long distance telephone um, uh, budget line. So I was able from my desk to um, talk to people all over the country. I could take uh, issues or problems that I was having at work and pick up the phone or they would be calling me. One, um, one time I had a major, major snafu and um, a woman called uh, through the ISPI thing and said, uh, I told her, I said, oh my God, that all of the, I just did a dump on uh, all of the problems about the slides that weren't going to be there for the major board meeting for the major reorganization. And she said, well, obviously the AV goddesses have to be prayed to. <laughs> and there was just something so nice and relaxing about that um, that really made a big difference. Um, so, um, when I was vice president, uh, I got to work closely with Claude Lineberry and Bob Powers and Stephanie Jackson and Deborah Stone. And um, each of them brought so much in the way of knowledge and experience that um, I just was a little sponge. It wasn't necessarily so much about the technology per se. Mm -hmm. We didn't have those kinds of discussions, uh, but it was much more about positioning the technology. It was much more about how do we market it. Uh, we were involved in the first developing the first strategic plan for ISPI, and we were trying to figure out how could we get the government, the U.S. government, to understand that this technology existed. It was through that work that we decided to hire a PR firm, a lobbying firm actually. Um, and later I was able to take 12 or 14 people to the White House uh, where we met with a, a an advisor, policy advisor, to talk about this technology. Not sure it resonated or they understood where we were going, um, but that was one of the attempts to help the whole nation, all of the businesses in the country as well as government, to understand that uh, the random way they were doing things, which is really what it was, um, and I would go so far as to say the um, modeling from Harvard Business School and Wharton and so on that had been telling people for a long time that you could manage anything. You didn't need to know the content. Mm -hmm. um, and I was up close and personal with some disasters that that philosophy uh, it, uh, caused and so there were opportunities with um, 
the folks that I mentioned to be looking at how the technology could work, but also what we needed to do to ensure that it was um, in the minds of leaders across the across the business world. Mm -hmm. And it's been one big issue, I think, is trying to uh, promote it, get it to be better understood, and part of it is our own language with it, and that it varies so much that uh, it's hard for others to grasp because we because of the issues that we have with how we label things. Mm -hmm. Or um, define performance. Yes, yes. And there's been quite a controversy that we've been in the middle of on that particular thing. Mm -hmm. Well, talk to us a little bit about uh, any, for especially for new people entering the field, um, what people or articles or books were of most influence to you? You've mentioned some, but... but is there anything else that you might add and say, you know, people should check these things out, these people out? You know, um, I have to tell you that I came at it sideways mm -hmm. and also have a sideways brain, as I've referred to it. Um, so um, the big one for me was Bob Mager's six pack and um, the explanation about performance um, and I'm not sure that there was anything else that was as powerful as that for me uh, what that gave me the scaffolding mm -hmm. to understand what uh, really what performance was and also the question of the different interventions and how you use those that they are more effective and cheaper than training. Um, it armed me to keep people from having me make stupid training programs for them. Um, so I would say really that was the most influential. Mm -hmm. um, I read in other fields yes. <laughs> and have lists of names, but in um, performance technology, and instructional technology. I've read all of Danny's books many times, <laughs> but that's because I've been editing them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, the Mager uh, Six Pack is certainly a, a set of classics that I think anybody in the field should be uh, pointed to, and hopefully uh, uh, they should devour those. Let me switch gears here a little bit. Uh, um, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, uh, you know, as if mm -hmm. as if you were at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor and they come up to you and say, Kathleen, what do you do for a living? What, what's your 30-second elevator speech? Okay. Um, I often draw an analogy and tell a little story. And I say, you know, everybody works. It's also true that everybody sings. But until the development of the scale and notes and octaves. It really wasn't possible to replicate or improve on the music. So it was an oral tradition. We have kind of an oral tradition around work. So what uh, we do, Danny and I, using the language of work is um, we're able to identify the six elements of work, of performance, and we get to do this by pulling everything out of people's heads. They all know something, but we give them a track to follow. We draw a picture of the work and we get agreement from the people in the room that, yeah, that's it. That's what it looks like. And then without emotion and coming from a very emotional person, this is key, uh, without emotion, um, they're able to make changes and agree on those and make improvements so that they can reach the objectives that they have, whether they're um, financial or uh, just uh, less conflict in the workplace or whatever. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, that's how I tend to do it. And then sometimes if somebody has a systems head, I can go into it or people who have had other experiences 
<clears throat> I can build on their experiences. And in general, I say we improve work and people go, wow, I wish you could do it in our place. <laughs> it's the universal need, isn't it? It is. It, it is. really is. Let me shift again here to my next question. Uh, we're all lifelong learners, more or less. What mm -hmm. can you share with us? Uh, do you have a current focus or next focus for where, where, what you're trying to learn? Um, I do, and <clears throat> it's um, what I'm able to do now is to build on all of the things that I've learned over these several decades. Um, so I consider myself a maker. Um, I'd almost say an artist, but there's a lot of connotations with that, mm -hmm. including achievement. Um, so I'm more comfortable with the idea of making. In particular, I um, make fabric collages. And in the process, I take classes um, wherever we travel. So I just took a basket making class in New Zealand and another class up in Vancouver. Um, by the way, I learned to sing when I was 60. So it is really, I'm always out there learning some new things. Um, the work that I've been doing in my semi-retired state um, includes being on a board, but also bringing to Bellingham uh, a poverty simulation, which has um, been a very effective tool here. It was built in uh, Missouri and it involves 80 to 100 people. And we're getting ready to do it the third time here in uh, Bellingham. Um, I also do strategic planning and reorganization in my church. It's been an 11 year project, learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll do coaching um, as different problems come up. Um, and I would say that now my real focus is on aging well and dying well. Um, number of people, a lot of people that were our friends in ISPI have gone to the great beyond. Uh, it seems like more than in other places. I mean, we've counted 15 or 20 um, who died before they were 70. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a lot to me. Um, but it looks like we'll be around a while. So that's the, the current focus. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Shifting again, is there a mm -hmm. favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you're not comfortable with how people are using this phrase or this term um, and you want to put your own spin on it? Oh, I'd probably really end up deferring more uh, to Danny, who probably answered that question already. But um, that performance, behavior, and work mm -hmm. are uh, all the same and it would be useful if people understood that um, so that's what I would probably say if I were fussing about something <laughs> well good thank you that's helpful uh, again let's shift here the this is the second to last thing I have and uh, but this is I, I'm asking for stories of people from the past or present um, that we can bring to life uh, and humanize them a bit uh, for people who never had a chance to meet them in that. And before we started this, you, you indicated that you might have a story about Frank Weidra to tell, about your husband, Danny Langdon, and about your good friend and former boss and uh, a subordinate, I guess, uh, Erica <laughs> Keeps. Uh, so... What, what can you share with us about Frank? Well. Because <laughs> there's a million stories Frank about was, Frank, so. That, that's true. <laughs> Frank was a madman. There's no question about it. Um, he had an incredible mind and an incredible ability to um, do, build organizations. Uh, he was an 800-pound gorilla for me in the sense that, uh, he would build the artifact 
whatever it was, not not in its detail, but what the structure needed to be. And one of the things that happened was that uh, he, in the process, he would really tick people off. They would be mad at him. And um, then we would discuss it. I was in on the planning or whatever it was that, that we were working on. And I would go and visit the president of the organization or a vice president or whatever. And at one point, um, Mike Fritz, a president, looked at me and he said, you know, Kathleen, Frank comes in here and tells me all this stuff and it just ticks me off. And then you come in and you tell me the same thing and I agree with you. So it's more, it's really something that Frank understood that I had a velvet glove. Um, I was tough and I didn't give in, um, but he knew how to use people in the good sense of being used. Mm -hmm. He also, as I mentioned, um, an incredible ability to reward people uh, for incredibly hard work. And one of the things that happened for me in um, ISPI was that I would meet people the first year that I was there. And then I would see them again a year later and we would be chatting about work. And I started to notice that the work that I had done in that year was four or five times as much and as complicated as what they were working on. And the next year and the next year. So I had a very strong feeling of um, the growth that was happening to me uh, without, without my really knowing it. And it was at ISPI that I was able to measure that growth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also hoping to tell you a little bit about my experience with ISPI. Um, but um, the thing with Erica um, had to do again with uh, an insight that she had, uh, which was that I hated to finish things. And when she was first managing me, and I was uh, 30-ish, um, she would wait until the project was finished. And um, I'd be working on it for a week, maybe two weeks, and she'd start getting restless and wanting to see it. Um, and then she realized that if she gave me a new project, but told me I couldn't start it until I finished the other one. And so um, that actually, I use that on myself now uh, with the things that I'm making. I set up deadlines, I make commitments to people, and I have my next two or three projects. Uh, also, just an, as an aside, there's a thing called the Colby Index, K O L B E Index which has a very, very high correlation um, to matching people, for matching people to the job, especially when it's knowledge work. Mm -hmm. And one of the characteristics that I happened to have that was almost off the charts was quick start. And again, this is one of those areas where a lot of people start kind of slowly. I start before I know anything about what I'm doing. But then in the middle, I have to um, go back, uh, back up the truck and get things put into place. And that includes uh, deadlines. So um, it's, uh, she was one of the people um, who really helped me to see that. Um, Excellent, thank you. Before we go to ISPI, let's, let's oh, talk, oh, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry, and you asked about Danny. Yes, Danny. Um, right. And uh, the one thing I want to say about that, because people, um, ISPI has a number of ISPI marriages, and we are one of them. We're heading into year 27 um, now. Um, but when we started working, he was very clear that the relationship 
came first. That if it were, if the if a problem came up and it was a question of the relationship or the business, that we would always go for the relationship. Um, now, obviously, as a second marriage and a midlife marriage, that was certainly easier to do. I couldn't have done it before then, but I thought that that's um, useful for people to know. Yes, thank you. All right, let's shift slightly to ISPI, uh, my professional home since 1979, your professional home since before that, since I met you when I first got involved at MSIT, which was the Michigan Society for Instructional Technology in Detroit. Um, what, what, what would you like to share with us about uh, ISPI? Well, um, I had, as I mentioned, um, a very interesting experience. Um, first, by being in all of these different positions and being a vice president. Um, but some of the things that were happening during that time included um, the creation for a while of something called the SAP, mm -hmm. poor name. <laughs> Uh, the senior advisory panel and there were a lot of questions about whether that was going to be a shadow to the board. One observation I would make is that um, being on the board is um, a well, fascinating experience but we don't necessarily choose board members based on one of the two criteria that I would love to see, which is management experience and technical expertise. So in the board that I had, um, we did not, we were not strong in the managerial experience. And that was really a problem in that our, um, executive director, it was Paul Tremper at the time, um, died in office. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened was that he knew that I was going to be the president, having been president-elect for a year. And he knew he was very ill. And so he um, did the absolute minimum. That was what he was capable of doing, which uh, really infuriated a number of people inside the organization. So um, he had not put into place many of the things that needed to be in place, including any of the infrastructure for the conference. It was also in that year that um, it was the early 90s and it was a recession, uh, or we just had a recession recessions mean less budget for the organization. So we were really uh, financially in a real bind. Um, so what, um, what one of the things that happened was that I was forced into <clears throat> really looking at what did we need in an executive director. And um, I thought seriously about whether that would be a job that I would want. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at it and it became very clear to me with a little bit of performance technology and HR experience um, that the skill set needed to run an association uh, is a different skill set from being a performance technologist. Now, there are overlaps and there's no question about it. And for an association executive director, I'm sure it would be much easier to be the executive director of a horse riding dressage organization or a flute, all the flutes in the country, mm -hmm. uh, flautists they're called, um, because there wouldn't be any real overlap. Um, in our organization, there is an overlap, which I think will always cause some tension. 
I do believe that it's similar, really, to um, what happens in IT departments. And we did a major project um, there uh, where managing the organization is a very full-time tough job to also be able to innovate in the technology and being up to date and to incorporate is something um, really very difficult as well. So, and rarely do you find someone who can do both. And I think that that, uh, from what I can tell, is still a shadow on our organization. That tension is there. Um, but um, the board, in my experience, has more than enough work to do. And they're also almost always have a full-time, very demanding job, and usually families and other community um, requirements and, and interests. Um, and so getting the, the work done in the course of a year is very big. To be able to also push the organization um, through um, uh, breakthroughs in technology or even focuses on um, is a major intervention in our society. So it's, um, I'm just saying that in my experience, the tension is um, likely to stay. And uh, good luck to anybody who tries <laughs> to figure it out. I think there might be a solution and I really just want want to be sure to um, be capturing the fact that um, it's a long-term problem, mm -hmm. very long-term problem. Yeah, it will be solved overnight. No, uh, not at all. Well, thank you for everything that you've shared with us. As a wrap to our interview, um, I'm asking you for any words of wisdom or guidance that you might have for people entering the field. What what can you? What would you share with them? Mm. Um, I there's a quote, um, and I think that uh, it's a very useful one, and that is: amateurs build elaborate models; pros build elegant models. So, to me, what that means is uh, a lot of things, and um, certainly. I think that um, my best advice is uh, based on that, and it's um, really move out of amateur status as, as fast as you can. Um, and that involves any number of things, and it depends on where you were and what you did and all of those others. Um, another anecdote that just popped in my mind, I had a, a, a client who had done a master's in instructional design, and I'm forgetting the school right now, but it, when I was doing some staff development for her, one of her observations to me was, she said, well, I've studied all those guys, Gary Rumler and Don Tosti and, and all of them, but you knew them. And you're able to capture for my folks um, who they really were and what their contributions were. The third one, and I didn't set out to do three, but the third one is um, an observation I may have made with uh, people coming out of some of the doctoral programs and so on, is to not be arrogant with the client. Because we have a tool, and it's a very powerful tool, I have unfortunately had to coach some people out of looking down their nose at the client. Um, so that would be uh, a key piece of advice. I assume that the other people that you've interviewed can tell them what books to read and where to go and so on. Um, but those would be my my very practical, concrete suggestions. Thank you so much for that. And, and thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me. Um, 
I hope you enjoy your semi-retirement and keep a nice balance there between personal things and professional things. And I thank you so much for your contributions and the influence that you had to me personally starting back in 1979 and, and your leadership that you exhibited at our local chapter in Detroit and then also at the international organization. Kathleen, thank you so much and have a great day. Uh, thank you, Guy. All right, bye-bye.